Hey there, hope you all have had a great day. For today's video, I'll be making an end table that was commissioned by the day job. Former boss of mine is retiring after 36 and a half years. He hates it when we shortchange him that last half year. Uh, so this table was inspired by the gentleman's survival kit that Freddie over at Redneck DIY made a while back. I'll put a link to his video up in the cards. Uh, as you'll see, I've added my own take to this by making it into an end table, making the top out of a red Kula Burl from Australia, and I added resin to it as well. I've added lowball glasses that I etched myself, and I'll show you how I did that. And I added a bottle of Top Shelf Tangare, all set in Kaizen foam. I then turned the handle from the same burl and resin and added coasters to keep the top in perfect condition. Right, Jen? You're going to use the coasters? <laughs> Let's get started. The first step for me is the step that most people go through on your projects is you break down the lumber. I bought some two inch thick cherry for this project and I wanted to resaw it so I could get a three quarter inch board and a half inch board out of it. So this is what you've seen me do here. Once I have the boards resawed, you get you gotta get rid of the bandsaw marks. And I do that over at the planer. I do what's called skip planing. So I'll plane one side and I'll plane the other for each board. I don't have a jointer, so this is the best way for me, with the tools I have, to get rid of all of the bandsaw marks. Going back to the bandsaw, I have this red Kulaba burl from Australia that I'll be using for this project. I want to get a 90 degree angle on this. And I also need to use these offcuts here for the handle, which you'll see me turn later. Now this cut it needs to be 90 degrees to the last cut I made, so I'm using my speed square here. Once I get this done, I'll be resawing this piece in half. Each, each piece is maybe a quarter inch thick. In order for it to be stable on the bandsaw, I wanted to sandwich it between two boards just so I have a little more stability. And I drew a line down the center of this as best as I could. Uh, cause I, I like to do my resawing freehand rather than up against a fence. Uh, I feel that I have more control and I get better results doing it this way. Now that I have the lumber milled to its proper thickness, I need to get it down to its rough dimensions for length. So I'm taking the boards that I have and cutting them down into two smaller boards and then two longer boards, and those will make up the sides of the, uh, of the box. Here, I've sped it up a little bit. So I don't have a jointer, as I mentioned before, and I need to get a straight edge on each of these boards so I can get it, uh, get the other side cut as well. So to establish the first straight edge, I put double-sided tape on a, on a flat piece of, of plywood. Now that I have one straight edge that I can refer reference up against the table, I can cut the other edge on the table saw. being smart there, not getting in there while the blade's running. There I had a little binding, and I don't have a riving knife for my bandsaw, or my table saw. Uh, 
so I just flipped it over and, and tried the cut from the other way. So here I'm adding rabbits, uh, just using my cross-cut sled. Uh, really, I should have done the rabbits about half of the board's thickness. I think I went about two-thirds of the way up this time, and it did cause me problems later on. And I don't have a router table either, so this is just my own homemade version. Uh, to get, add a little stability, I hot glued that, that piece of 2 by 4 to it so I can kind of hold on to the bands or the router from that angle and give, give a little more stability to the cut. And it worked great. So I added that rabbit to all four corners, uh, or all four sides of the box, as you can see in the next bit. And then I measured the board based on that cut. So I like to have the relative dimension here rather than trying to get it beforehand. Now that I have the, the bottom of the board put in, I start to rip the top apart from the bottom of the box. I like to make my boxes this way. I think it gives good grain continuity. Everything looks symmetrical and it looks like it's all from one piece because it really was all from one piece. The only trick with doing it this way is you want to make your final cut, this last cut, on the long side of the box. That way it's not top heavy and it won't tip. Here's my fourth cut right here and you can see it's on the long side of the box. And it comes apart nicely. So this is the top and this panel is real thin. I think I got it down to a quarter inch uh, and, I'm, and I am gluing it and nailing it in place. The resin's going to be on top of this, so any expansion and contraction in the wood, I really want to limit. So I made the board thin, and I glued it, and I nailed it, uh, because this resin's going to be sitting on top of it. Here's my, my fancy clamping system. I did uh, color the, the wood glue with some uh, mica powder, uh, just in case it seeps out. I don't want to see it. There's my fancy clamps. Clamp champ. Okay, onto the resin. So for the resin, I really wanted it opaque. I didn't want to have any sort of translucency whatsoever. So I had a, a lot of powders and a lot of uh, liquid pigment as well, uh, and mixed it very well. We got a real rich dark black, uh, but the the white pearl X powder that I added kind of does add a little shimmer to it. So there's there's depth to the resin, and it's not just straight black. I ended up using about 64 ounces of resin on this project. Uh, it's not very thick, it's maybe only a quarter inch thick, uh, but there's a lot of surface area to cover. You can see in the back I have the uh, the mold that I made for the handle, which I'll show that I, that I turn later. Doing resin like this, you'll need to use a heat gun. This will help the resin flow better, one, get it up to temperature, two, which is what makes it cure, is getting hot, and then three, it's going to remove all your air bubbles so you get a nice smooth finish. Here I am mixing up my second batch of resin. I had, I had some of it to the top of the table, but I also added to the, uh, the handle, which I'll turn shortly. I was never really able to get a good flat surface with a belt sander. I tried and tried and I, I just couldn't do it. There's still divots in it. Uh, so I wanted to make it perfectly flat. Only way I knew to really do that was to make this really quick, quick router sled. It was just two by fours that I, that I uh, clamped to my table saw. Cut a hole in a board and hot glued the uh, router to it. And it worked really well. Uh, great way to flatten your project. So this is baking soda. This is actually a tip I picked up from watching uh, Mark Spagnola on the Wood Whisperer channel uh, to use hot water and just uh, baking soda. This really darkens up the, cher the cherry real nicely. You can tell it's kind of light at first, but adding this 
just mixture uh, chemically stains the wood. So rather than a pigmented stain that you know could chip off if you do anything with this this chemical stain, uh, just really ages the piece nicely. And here I'm adding my uh, Howard's uh, Feed and Glow polish. It's just a uh, really orange and beeswax uh, to it. It's a very natural finish. Just rub it on with my hands. I don't like a lot of lacquers and polyurethanes on tables. Uh, you know, I find a, a more natural finish is, is more pleasing, uh, and, and it's easier to, to reapply than a polyurethane would be or a varnish. You see the beautiful color on that cherry. So after I sanded it, I think I sanded it down to 600 grit. Uh, wanted to get to the uh, all the sanding residue, all the, the sawdust off of the piece. So I used denatured alcohol to clean it, and then I'll be adding a. And it's actually a wood turner's abrasive wax. Uh, so this will further sand the piece. Uh, I don't know what the, the grit equivalent would be, but it works wonderfully on my wood turnings. So I wanted to try it on this table too, and, and it worked fantastic. I uh, just added a liberal coat to it and then uh, got out my buffer and buffed away at it. And that, as, the, as the wax breaks down, uh, the grit in it gets finer and finer and really adds a nice sheen to, to the piece. Once the last bit of that's wiped off, I go back and add my uh, beeswax and orange essence polish to the top as well. And again, you apply that liberally and then wipe off the excess. And once I'm done with this, I put a new pad on the buffer, and I'll give it another go at that. This provides you with a nice matte finish. Again, I don't like shiny when it comes to wood. The, the natural glow that this gives. There's some close-up shots. You can tell the depth of the resin. I did pour it in two layers, and the top layer is a little more translucent than the bottom layer that I did. So you, it's hard to pick up on video, but you can really see down into the resin uh, when you look at it in person. Alright, next step is to turn the handle for this piece. I'm not going to focus too much on the turning because this video is already a little on the long side. But I, I did use the bandsaw to break it out of the mold. This is just a one time mold that I made out of cedar. Then I get it in a basic rectangle shape. I let my daughter do the, the videoing of, of this piece. She really wanted to uh, to be in the shop, so I let her handle the camera here. But it's a simple spindle turning. There's, there's nothing terribly fancy about it. I did have two, there you go, two divots that kind of came out. The resin I used wasn't a casting resin. It was more of a, a surface coating resin, uh, so it didn't hold up to turning very well. But I filled it with a five minute epoxy and then finished it. And that side is, is where I'm going to put the hardware to screw it into the table. So you can't see it. So I, I did a more uh, substantial finish on this one. I used CA glue and used micro mesh and really got it polished up. Since the handle is probably the only part you're really going to touch, 
Uh, I didn't want the oils in your skin to uh, to really wear off the finish here. So this is a plastic polish that I put on top of the uh, the CA glue finish and got a wonderful, wonderful shine and finish to this piece. Again, I wanted it to be more protective. So this is the first time I've, I've done etching. Uh, I thought I'd, I'd give it a whirl on this project. It's a real simple logo that, that we used. This is the company that uh, both Jim and myself work for. The day job. So I use my stencil cutter to cut out the logo and I'm adding just protective tape because I don't want to get this this etching cream anywhere on the glass other than the logo. Six minutes. So you rub the paste in for six minutes, go every direction, vertically, horizontally, diagonally, uh, every direction, you work it for six solid minutes. And then you take more of it and just really cover everything. You saturate it all with the, with the uh, armor etch. And then you let that sit for 20 minutes. A good thing about this stuff is you can reuse it. So you wipe off the excess and you can put it right back in the bottle and use it for the next time. After that, you take it to the sink, rinse it off. You want to get all of that off before you start to take off the stencil. And then you peel it off, and you're left with the etching. It's real subtle. Uh, really like this kind of etching on glasses. There you can see it came out flawless. And some glamour shots at the end. Really happy with the way this project turned out. You didn't see any of the hardware installation, but I used just simple hinges and these hooks I got from the local woodcraft. Then I did an insert Kaizen foam to kind of keep everything uh, nice and together. <laughs> and then I added the uh, annual report from 1982 when this gentleman first started working. I thought that was a nice touch. I hope you subscribe to my channel. I hope you really like this. Leave me some comments, and I've got the next video queued up for you. Thank you. Have a great day.